I'm Tamara, and this is TELUS Talks with Tamara Taggart. We're bringing together experts, thinkers, and leaders, busting myths, sharing stories, and staying connected when Canadians need it the most. We're having unexpected conversations for unprecedented times. Hi, everyone. Today, we are talking to Dr. Ross Green, a child psychologist. Dr. Green, nice to see you. Nice to hear you. You as well. So this is these are extraordinary times when it comes to so many things. But let's talk about uh, kids and parenting today, because, um, you know, parenting is hard. As you know, you're a parent. And uh, but it's it's really intense right now when we are home 24 seven with our kids. And I'm hoping that you can help all of us who are feeling things that we can't even really identify as parents. What are you hearing from people? Well, I'm hearing that um, uh, becoming your child's teacher as well as your child's parent is uh, tough. Mm. Um, there is such a thing as too much togetherness. I'm hearing, and I would agree with this, that parenting during a pandemic is a different animal. And the truth is, we've got to get that perspective, right? We are parenting during a pandemic. Yeah. Things probably aren't going to return to normal that quickly, much as we might like them to. Schools might not be open in September, mm. which means you're still going to potentially be your child's parent and teacher come September or August. We are parenting during a pandemic. This is a nasty disease. Um, our priorities change mm-hmm. when you are parenting during a pandemic. And that's a little bit of what I'm hearing out there. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because I kind of feel that, so my kids are 9, 11 and 12 and you know, parenting I thought it was hard when they were babies and it is. It's just a different kind of hard. Now it's a an even more different kind of hard if you will. So, I mean, in some ways I've I've, you know, I'm protecting them from all of the information that's out there. I want them to know a little bit of what's happening. I don't want to scare them. Um, Sometimes we put on the news and they ask to turn it off because they find it scary. So we do. Um, So like, can we tell them too much? Like, like where, how do we know where the balance is as parents with our kids? In terms of what to tell them? Yeah. You know, I tend to believe that if they are asking, they're looking for an honest answer. Um, That doesn't mean we have to load them up with all kinds of information. The truth is, number one, there's still a lot that's still unknown about this disease. But number two, what we do know is actually not all that complicated. As kids, they are, generally speaking, at somewhat lower risk. As a society, people are going to die from this. People die from the flu every year. This is worse. It's very contagious, which is why we're trying to be safe. Um, So I think that a lot of what we know, and we can tell kids, there's a lot we actually don't know. There's things we don't know about this. Um, Kids are good with that. So I'm actually less interested in protecting. I've always lived by the adage, if the kid's asking, they're looking for an honest answer. Right. And you give them the honest answer. You give them the honest answer. And the truth is, um, I don't think the honest answer is any less scary than the dishonest answer. I think that kids are pretty perceptive. They know when their parents are not giving them the straight poop. They know when their parents are not telling them everything. And I think that actually can be scarier. So if they're asking, I will tell Right. And I guess the other the other problem you can run into is when they hear information from their peers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes. They're going to hear it from somewhere. Um, there's all kinds of information on the Internet. Some of it is accurate. Some of it is not. If they're asking, they're asking for your honest appraisal mm. about what it is they're asking about. 
Right. Okay. So if, if um, people aren't um, familiar with um, Dr. Green's books, so you, you wrote The Explosive Child, which um, I mean, I I don't know. I, is it your most famous book? It, it, it appears to be. <laughs> it has sold the most copies as if that right. determined fame. I don't really keep track of fame. So I don't know <laughs> what book is most famous. So therefore it sold the most books. So I would say, yes, it's a very well-known book. Um, Raising Human Beings. I've just started to reread uh, this book of yours. And because I think it's a perfect time to be reading this book. Because I, I think that's what we're all trying to do. We're, we're just trying to raise decent human beings. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to raise kind, empathetic, you know, um, understanding children. And it's so hard to do, especially now, because, and I, 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 I can't be the only parent saying this, but when you are with your kids 24-7, <laughs> I love them. <laughs> But wow, it is, this is a, this is a wild experience. I am used to them being at school for six hours a day, learning, um, uh, getting tired, uh, and, you know, and then going about and doing their activities and driving them there and then coming home, we have dinner, a bath time, everybody's tired, we go to bed. That is not happening right now. Tempers are flaring. Um, we are, you know, we get on each other's nerves, all of us, there's five of us in this house. How do you, how do we know when our kids are struggling? How do we know when they are, this isn't, am I looking for certain behavioral things? What am I looking for as a parent? I think it's a big question, I know. It. Well, I think they let you know it. And the other option is if you think they're not very good at letting you know it, you can ask. Um, but you're right. 24 seven is tougher. It's also an incredible opportunity. I mean, I hate, to me, the silver lining is, um, you know, when you're rushing around, you're getting them out to school in the morning, you're not going to get to know your kid that way very well. You're rushing through dinner, you're rushing through homework, and it's bedtime, right? I don't know if you really get to know your kid that way. I don't know if you have, this is why I was always envious of teachers. They got my kids six hours a day. Mm. I didn't always, right? So I think that if we're going to put a positive spin on this, and why not, right? This is an opportunity to get to know your kids better, to model some things for them. Um, now you're not solely relying on their teachers who have them all day to be modeling the values that you most want to model for your children. And so... I think it's time to take a deep breath, take a step back. You don't got to do all what I just described in 24-7, but it's not a bad idea to take a step back and say, you know what, this could last a while. What do I want to accomplish here? Mm. And if too much togetherness is not wonderful, then how do we create some space for ourselves so that it's not constant? How do we deal with the things that are causing conflict? And my answer to that question is, my opinion, the way you should have been dealing with it all along, right? The way it's described in The Explosive Child and Raising Human Beings and Lost at School and Lost and Found, I think it's what we should have been doing all along, but often didn't have the time to do. If there's a problem, it needs to be solved collaboratively and proactively. But I think that this time presents us with a unique opportunity. Once again, this is positive spin. But once again, why not? Who do I want to be as a parent? What do I want to model? What, what values do I want to distill in, into my children, right? Mm. Us parents frequently don't give ourselves the luxury of thinking about that because in pre-COVID times, we were too rushed and too stressed and too busy. Well, you're still stressed. It's just about different things. But you probably actually do have time now to think about values, what you want to model for your kid, what you want to talk with them about in terms of the delicate balance between self-interest and interest of the community at large, the balance between economics, which is people needing to make money, 
versus keeping everybody safe, especially the most vulnerable. Those are things we should be talking about. Those are things that our kids will sink their teeth into. What are the values that we want to transmit to our kids? Mm. Now is the time. We've got a great opportunity to do it. I agree. It is a great opportunity. I mean, as, as adults, we have stresses. Those aren't our kids' stresses, for sure. Worrying about, you know, paying the bills or buying groceries, all of those things. Those are adult stresses. Um, but yeah, I mean, how well do we know our kids when they are away from us for most of the day? And I used to feel really bad about that as a parent. Like, I saw my kids at breakfast for a very short period of time. And then I saw my kids. I never had uh, my job went till 7 p.m., so I never saw my kids at dinner. I just was home for bath time and then bed, a story, and then that was it. And I, I, I was barely present. Right. You know, and, uh, and ever present. I am always present. And, and I mean, we've tried to embrace these things. I, I had to like step back and go this online school right? This is also stressful for parents because we feel this need that our kids are going to fall behind. Our kids are not going to do well. Our kids are going to, this is going to affect them for the rest of their lives. Um, Other kids are going to do better than them. Um, All these things that we have in our head as parents, whereas, I mean, the kids seem to be doing just fine with school and uh, they've adjusted quite well, most of them. And I I understand also there's different learners, right? We have very and behavioral issues and we have there there is a wide spectrum of kids. We're talking in general terms here. But um, when you think about kids missing school right now, um, is this going to affect them for the rest of their lives? Are they going to be in their 50s and, and this this period of time will still affect them as adults because they missed four months of school? You know, when you work with the kind of kids I often work with, kids who've been struggling in school for a long time, kids who are behind, kids who um, people aren't sure that they'll be able to get caught up. Um, If you're doing the right thing for kids, development happens. They get caught up. They go as fast as they can go. Development goes as fast as the kid is able to make it go. I work with a lot of kids who had done no schoolwork for two or three years. Just want to give some perspective here. Kids who've done nothing academically for two or three years. We get them in the right place. We give them the help they need. They kick in and nobody's sitting around saying, oh, those two or three years. They're sitting around saying, Look at him go now. Mm. So um, I'm actually more worried about the conflict that is caused between parents and kids when parents are stressed out about the academics and worrying about a three or four month gap than I am about the three or four months. Let's say the kid misses three or four months academically completely. I'll take that over the conflict that would be caused by us stressing out over the three or four months that the kid is going to miss. Hands down. No competition. I really, uh, that makes me feel really good that you said that. Because that makes sense to me. This is logical. (laughs) You're so logical, Dr. Green. Um, I'll try to make sense. You really do. And so when we we talk about um, parents, you know, what... You, when you work with um, kids that um, have challenges when it comes to learning or behavior, uh, when you look at um, that that group of of children who um, are now in this time where they're spending twenty four seven, this is it's very difficult on on parents. When mm-hmm. I mean, when you have a typical child who's doing well, that's hard. But then you have kids that my, my son has Down syndrome. So that's a whole other ball game, right? Um, he doesn't learn well online. He just doesn't. He yeah. doesn't have the, you know, the, the attention span for that. iPads are fun and they're a reward for him, not a learning tool for him. So we, we you know, we're doing what we can. And um, I, the guilt that I was holding, I had to let go of. 
when you when you're talking about parents who uh you know and children with maybe ADHD or um you know autism uh you know uh, needs that are maybe a bit more challenging when it comes to behavior what is your advice for those parents same as it would always be the behavior this is not pandemic advice this is advice pre, during, and post-pandemic, right? Identify the expectations your child is having difficulty meeting and work with your child to solve those problems. That's the advice I've been giving for 25 years. It's no different during a pandemic. The disadvantage many parents have is that they often have not been aware of how the school has been perhaps successfully, dealing with a lot of those challenges. And so we've got parents who often feel like they're in the dark about how to deal with something that the school may actually have been on top of. That said, and so we don't want parents to be in the dark. If you're a parent who feels in the dark and you have access to the folks who were working with your kid pre-pandemic, ask them what they were doing and how they were doing it, right? Why fly blind, right? But believe it or not, there are a lot of kids who like it this way. They are not stressed about going to school. They are not stressed about peer interactions at the moment. I'm not talking about everybody. I'm talking about some, right? Perhaps especially some of the ones that I tend to work with. They are not stressed about being mistreated. They are not stressing about getting into trouble. They may actually be getting more work done. They may actually prefer socially interacting, not in person. So there's nothing stereotypical that we can say about a kid's experience during a pandemic. All we can do is be responsive to what's sitting in front of us and the signals that they're giving us and what they're telling us about how they're dealing with it. And if they're not doing a good job of telling us, asking, that's the best we can do. The best we can do is your best under very trying times. Mm-hmm. I like that you you always bring it back to asking, asking the child. How often do we ask our kids? You know, how are you doing? How is school? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's talk about challenging behavior at home with COVID. Uh, just and, and when we say with COVID, COVID, this experience, this pandemic. So we are home. Uh, you know, if if many of us, when we go outside, it's just for a walk or maybe a bike ride or, you know, the park, uh, if nobody else is around, but are, are, are you hearing, um, I know that some of my friends are seeing different behaviors in their kids because they are home and you're, they're with their siblings 24 seven too. So this adds a whole other dynamic. Um, you know, maybe there are kids that have never shown challenging behavior that are now showing Things that parents haven't seen? Just remember, behavior is the signal. Behavior is just the signal. I don't really care what behavior it is. Some are obviously tougher to take than others. But behavior is the signal. Behavior is the kid telling us, I'm stuck. There are expectations I'm having difficulty meeting. That's all behavior is. And here we've added some new expectations during a pandemic right? The academic expectations were there all along, but we've now added the expectation that you do it remotely, that you learn remotely. We've added the expectation that your parent is now the primary helper on things that are difficult, not necessarily your classroom teacher. That could break in either direction, by the way. We've added the expectation that you are with your your siblings a lot more than you used to be. We've added the expectation that you may be um, indoors Uh, and not able to engage in a lot of your usual social activities, we've added a bunch of expectations during the pandemic. And if a kid is behaving in ways that we've not seen before, or even in ways that we have seen before, that's just the way the kid is letting us know there are expectations I'm having difficulty meeting. So as I always do, don't focus on the behavior. Focus on the expectation the kid is having difficulty meeting and have that conversation so y'all can resolve it together. Mm. But I also 
should say that during unusual times, um, you may have to ease up a little bit. And in fact, you're probably going to have to ease up a little bit. I, um, I probably can't access it right now without screwing up our screen. But a principal in Tennessee sent me a, a wonderful letter that he wrote home to parents um, just as the pandemic was beginning and just as schools were closing. And he was saying, don't worry about the academics. Connect with your kids. Listen to music together. Play Legos together. Do puzzles together. Don't stress about the academics. That is not something I want you adding to your home dynamic during stressful times. Connect with your kids. Communicate with your kids. Work on your relationship with your kids. Once again, this is an opportunity. There's the silver lining. Life is not going to go the way life usually goes during a pandemic. There are going to be some expectations that we're going to just have to ease up on. On the ones that we can't ease up on, we're solving those problems with our kids together. And if they are sibling issues, we are facilitating a process in which siblings can collaborate together on solutions. Oh, boy, if you do that, you are so working on your relationship during this mm -hmm. pandemic, their relationship, communication, how to solve problems together, how to listen, how to be empathic. What an opportunity. It is a great opportunity. I agree. I, uh, it's interesting, though, because sometimes when, I mean, I've never done this before. You know, I've never been a parent before. This is my first, my first and only go at it, right, with these three kids. I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to mess them up. I don't want to make, I don't want to repeat any mistakes that were made when, you know, maybe I was brought up or, you know what I mean? Like, we all have these things inside of us that we don't want to repeat or we don't want to. So it's, it's very, and it's hard to not be reactionary as a parent. It's hard to not lose your temper sometimes, you know, when you can, you know, the fight is continuing over whatever. Are, at what point, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is how, how do we, how do, as parents, how do we balance that? I don't want to, I don't want to mess this up with, I, I hope I'm doing the right thing with, you know what I mean? It's, it's like, it's everything you're saying makes total sense. And I want to do all of it perfectly, like you're saying, mm -hmm. and I'm trying my best, but I mean, we're human beings and we lose our tempers or we, you know, we just want to go upstairs and close the bedroom door and read a magazine with a cup of tea for an hour and have nobody come in. Just all of these things. You know? I, bet you could, I bet you could arrange that with your kids. <laughs> I bet you could pull that off. But here's the interesting thing. Um, I get it. You know, this is the other interesting thing. Because you're with your kids so much, your drive for perfection and not wanting to screw it up is even more intense because you're reminded of it during every waking hour. <laughs> yes. right? so that's even more intense. Perfection's not the goal, right? Take care of yourself too. You can, you can, you can. You can arrange for some space that you need. You're a member of this family too. You can collaborate with your kids on getting the space that you need. Perfection is not the goal. Biggest One big goal is to get you out of the heat of the moment. The expectations your kids are having difficulty meeting are predictable. You only find yourself in the heat of the moment if you're dealing with them in the heat of the moment. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can make a list of the things you want to work on with your kids, the problems that you need to solve, and if you the expectations they're having difficulty meeting. You can decide after you make that list of expectations whether you even want to pursue those expectations right now, whether it's even worth it right now. Some you'll say yes. Some you'll say no. If you make that list for each kid, maybe even your significant other, you can solve those problems collaboratively and proactively so you don't find yourself in the heat of the moment and you don't find yourself losing it because you're solving those problems proactively before they even come up. Cut yourself some slack. The goal is not perfection. I think that conflict is a much more poignant sign of blowing it 
than the fact that you may screw something up because you're not being a perfect parent. Right. Conflict tells you something is not going well right now. And often what's not going well when there's conflict between parents and kids is you are pursuing an expectation that your child is having difficulty meeting and you're trying to deal with it once again in the heat of the moment instead of proactively and in tandem, collaboratively with your child. I don't think conflict, I've always said, I talk about this in Raising Human Beings, conflict is not a given. Disagreements are a given. Kids having, disagree, kids having difficulty meeting some of our expectations, those are the givens. Conflict is not a given. Not if you're working on these problems proactively and collaboratively. Right. This is why I'm rereading Raising Human Beings. I need a brush up on this. This parenting thing, it changes daily. It's uh, There's always new challenges. And I mean, and as you say, we're, you know, we're together 24 seven and we're really seeing it. Uh, we're really seeing it happen before our eyes. What, what happens when a parent sees, um, y- you know, something in their child that is exactly like them and it's not the, <laughs> you see, you see your child acting in a way that is so you and is maybe not your best attribute at, are there ways to like, do, is that just a natural process of kids watching their parents or are there ways to, you know what I mean? Do you understand what I'm trying to ask you here? <laughs> I do, but, but I guess the main thing is um, it really doesn't matter. It, it makes it a little bit more personal. Mm. If it's a characteristic that you think they got from you. But the bottom line is let's separate ourselves and, may, and a part of you that you may not like so much. Let's separate ourselves from that. Right. Let's turn it into an expectation that your child is having difficulty meeting. Maybe how they're treating somebody. Maybe how they're resolving conflict. Maybe how they're resolving disagreements. Maybe the way they are carrying themselves in a way that you don't think is going to go over so well with siblings or peers. Let's, let's try to move it away from you and just turn it into an, an expectation. Mm-hmm. that they may be having difficulty meeting. If it's an expectation, I would call it an unmet expectation. But those of you who know my work know that what I would call it is an unsolved problem. And once we identify it, we can have that conversation with the kid, right? But the yeah. first thing I'm going to ask myself is, is this a characteristic that I would have been easily able to change in myself? If not, I might let it be. Right. You can't change everything. <laughs> These are all so true. Simple, true, uh, you know, statements that we really need to remember that we perfection is not the goal. It. We especially need to remember it when we're together so much. Exactly. So just to go back to your books, um, I mentioned that I'm rereading um, Raising Human Beings, which is excellent. These are all available as audiobooks too. The Explosive Child... Um, and Lost at School, I have not read that one. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about Lost at School. It is what the model looks like in a school. And um, it's a a toss-up between Raising Human Beings and Lost at School, as it relates to which is my favorite. Um, Lost at School is about 50% a running story. Um, And so um, it's not quite as technical. It has many poignant moments in it. From the story, uh, it, it is about kids and educators trying to get their arms around collaboration instead of using power to accomplish things, partnership rather than being adversaries, being teammates rather than enemies on solving the problems that are affecting kids' lives. And it it brings in the voices of people who sometimes don't react so well to this model when they're first hearing about it. People who have what we might call a more traditional view of discipline and perhaps a not especially complementary view of parents whose kids are behaviorally challenging at school. So it weaves together a lot of the factors that come into play in schools um, and it just 
helps people learn how to do this in a school. Um, I think it's one of my top two favorites. So you've got to read it. I will read it right after Raising Human Beings. And then you wrote another book called Lost and Found. Lost and Found is a somewhat more technical follow-up to Lost at School. Okay. Okay. That book actually has the voices of real teachers in it. Um, Lots of voices of teachers saying, here's what the model did for us. Here's some kids we did it with. Um, Here's what I learned. Here's how I'm different. Excellent. And you're right. You you are writing now while you're in isolation. Is that what you're doing? I've got three books in the hopper. Uh, the <laughs> novel is just finished and is being sent off to see if any publisher wants to publish it, probably on Monday. Then I'm going to turn my attention to revising Lost and Found. And then I'm going to write a third book um, that is just the most recent rendition of the collaborative and proactive solutions model. It will be more for clinicians, but it's also going to have quite a bit of information in it about how to not use restraint on seclu- and seclusion mm. on our most vulnerable kids. And we, so, we've had that a lot in the news uh, also in Canada over the years. Yeah. And uh, it is, uh, I mean, well, I could talk to you for hours about that when it comes to uh, uh, kids with disabilities in schools. So we, we'll leave that for another time. But also your website, your, your, your nonprofit organization, what a wonderful website. It's, it's just you. a great place for parents to go. And uh, I mean, you can just dig around there forever and find all cut. The documentary is there. Uh, there are so many um, uh, articles you can read and just really get so much information. Why did you start this nonprofit? Well, I wanted to give the model away for free. I don't think you should have to buy a book to learn about the model. Websites offer us opportunities for streaming video and audio programming, which is a better way to learn for some people who are not necessarily readers. But what Lives in the Balance, the nonprofit, is doing now is moving very heavily into the advocacy realm. We need more people to change their lenses. We need more people to change their practices because we are still losing a lot of kids because of obsolete lenses and obsolete practices. And um, so Lives in the Balance um, is at the fore of trying to change things for better, not just for our most vulnerable kids, but for all of them. Um, As we've been saying, uh, we all deserve to be treated with compassion, even our most vulnerable kids. Mm. Yes, you're speaking my language. And I love how you use collaboration. Uh, Empathy is a big part of your work. And, um, you know, do you can we teach empathy? I find that empathy can be taught primarily through the three steps that are involved in solving a problem collaboratively and proactively. When in the first step of doing that, adults are listening to kids to find out what's making it hard for a kid to meet a particular expectation. Adults are modeling empathy. Listening, as I've always said, is the most pure form of empathy. Listening. In the second step of solving a problem collaboratively, the kids are listening to us and what our concerns are. They're learning. And when we are coming up with solutions in the third step, and those solutions have to be mutually satisfactory, meaning those solutions have to address the concerns of both parties, um, I think you're teaching empathy and how to come up with solutions that don't just address your concerns, but address the concerns of another person. And we have never needed that more badly than we do right now. Isn't that the truth? Do you think that when this is when we come out on the other side of this pandemic, Dr. Green, that uh, we will be a more empathetic uh, community? Do you I mean, I know it's different where you are. Um, (laughs) I know things are a little bit different where you are. Um, You're in Maine uh, or the U.S. And um, I, I ask because. You know, you you talk about so many things that have been concerns um, here, you know, in in my own backyard when it comes to empathy and raising kids that have uh, special needs and um, they learn differently. Uh, You talked about, you know, seclusion and restraints and all of that stuff. That that is a huge part of my world. And um, I, I hope that when we we come out on the other side of this, that the adults in charge 
can put an empathetic lens on how we are teaching children, how we are um, treating children about inclusion, all of these things. But I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I hope that is my hope that we, we come out on the other side of this and we, we really learn from this experience. I hope the same. Um, I don't know how that's going to break. I think that there are going to be many caregivers uh, who are driven to make up for lost time um, and who may lose sight of how important it is to check in with kids about what this was like for them. And this, this is not a reality show. This is a pandemic. I hope people are not in such a rush to make up for lost time and get back to business as usual, that they lose sight of what's sitting in front of them. That's my hope. I'm not sure how it's going to break. Yeah. Okay. And one last question before we, uh, before we wrap up. Um, is it ever too late with kids? Is it ever too late to do the things that you talk about? Never. I saw a bumper sticker once that I wish I had on my car, but I couldn't quite tell where it came from. It said, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. But in, in, in my phraseology, it's never too late to listen. It's never too late to understand. It's never too late to communicate. And it's never too late to solve problems that have may have been affecting a kid for a very long time. How could it ever be too late? Dr. Green, I cannot thank you enough. Obviously, I could talk to you for, you know, probably eight hours about this topic. You are a wealth of information. You are a true gem. Your books are amazing. They've changed so many lives. Um, so thank you for taking the time. And I just want to remind everyone that you can go to uh, Dr. Green's website, which is uh, livesinthebalance.org, livesinthebalance.org. There is so much information there. Uh, and of course, you can get all of his books wherever you buy your books. Thank you, Dr. Green, for being with us. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure talking with you. This was fun. Thank you so much. And be sure to join us here on Tell Us Talks with Tamara Taggart every Tuesday and Thursday. <laughs>